Hi, I'm Hans Schultz and welcome. In this video, we'll talk about a few aspects of musical form, right? This is an introduction into its um, smaller um, structures, such as motifs, phrases, periods, um, phrase groups, and sentences. And although it is a lot of content, um, it seems like it is a lot of content, actually, um, it isn't, and I'll explain you why um, down the line, right? So you will understand how to use all those stuff, how to identify um, those aspects in um, musical compositions of other composers, and I will give you a little bit of guidance if you want to get deeper into the subject. I will give you books to read and other um, stuff to analyze. It's important that you watch the video until the end so that you get um, all the concepts and that you can then work by your own on those stuff. Now, um, something I forgot to mention is that if you want to study all of this, um, I created a full worksheet um, that you can download in the description. Um, it has everything I talk about in here, right, about um, all the structures. Plus, it has um, examples of periods and sentences, just so that you can analyze them and take a look at them by yourself. This is the material I created so that I could do the video. Um, everything I said, it's, it's there, right? And it's, it would be great if you downloaded it and showed me that um, it helped you in any way. So if it did, um, don't forget to leave a comment saying that you did actually download it and that it served you in any way. Second thing I must say really fast, um, I based this video on two um, important books uh, about the subject. The first one is Fundamentals of Music Composition by Arnold Schoenberg, which is just a really important um, book on the subject. And the second one, which is simpler, but that just helps you understand um, how everything works, is Form in Music by Wallace Berry. It's just very simple to understand. Um, if you were to read a book about the subject, um, the first one I would recommend is Wallace Berry's, and it will actually give you uh, an important head start on the subject. All right, so let's just dive into the content right away. So um, the first microscopic structure that you have to understand is the motif, right? So um, it is literally the smallest um, structure in musical um, form and composition. Its concept is just like if you have an idea, um, if you try to divide it into like the smallest um, recognizable um, like pieces of information, um, that's a motif. If you have like a phrase, um, which you will understand what it is later, um, perhaps you can divide it into three distinct motifs. And motifs um, as I said, they are simply like the smallest piece of recognizable information you can find. So whatever um, is um, somewhat specific is a motif, right? So um, it can be rhythmic, it can be melodic, or it can be both. A great example of a motif, um, just so that you have it in mind, is um, the motif from the uh, Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. Everyone knows that and it is very simple to understand. It has a distinct rhythm and it has a little bit of melodic material. When you listen to it in the piece, in the entire piece, you can um, recognize it even though it's incredibly small and that's a motif. The motifs are actually very um, changeable, like you can develop them really easily. As they are really simple, you can insert them into other contexts and they won't um, be like disfigured. Right, so uh, a little bit bigger than motifs, you have phrases. And phrases are also really small, but what defines them is actually um, not their size, but it's just like the smallest um, piece of information you can find that kind of has like a beginning, an e uh, a middle, like a little bit of development and an end, uh, usually marked by a harmonic can cadence. And most pieces actually have phrases, but I think a great example to have in mind is um, Beethoven's Opus 59, number one, first movement. Um, you can see very distinct phrases in the beginning, and I'll put it um, up so that you can um, listen to it and understand what is a phrase. And if you look at this phrase, it is composed of two different motifs. You have like that ascending um, line that is just um, very simple, you know, it's just a scale that goes up and then leaps down. And then you have that other descending line that has a little bit more character, it has a few skips. And it's very simple, um, you can see that there are like the, just two motifs um, glued onto each other, we call it um, juxtaposed onto each other, and uh, it just forms the phrase, right? So it's very simple, um, but 
Something else you can realize about phrases is that, like, although it gives this sense of finality, it never gives, like, that sense of, like, okay, now um, this has finished and um, we are going into something completely different. Like, it usually asks for something else and some completion later. Right, so now we are getting to more complex structures, um, such as the period. It is widely used in um, the Baroque um, periods, in the Classical period, the Romantic period, in 20th century and until today, right? So it's very, very common. So the basic concept of it is that you have um, two phrases, the first one called the antecedent and the second one, the consequence. Um, it is also sometimes called a question and an answer because it makes sense um, and it is more related to our daily lives, so it makes it a lot easier to understand. Another um, thing that is very important to notice on periods is that they have important harmonic material going on. So usually the antecedent um, has a cadence leading to the dominant of um, whatever key you're in, because then it leaves like, this um, openness to it, like it's, um, there's something else to come, um, which makes it sound like a question, a musical question. And then the consequence usually uses um, a one cadence, like a cadence to the root, right? And that's because um, it just creates like this um, um, kind of relationship that the first um, phrase is actually leading to the next one, right? And it just encloses everything into one um, more like exact unit. And not all periods have to cadence like the first uh, phrase to five and the second one to one. Right, um, that's not a rule, but it's just fairly common, and it's much easier to identify most periods because of this. In this case, um, I selected um, Beethoven's once again Opus Two, Number One. Um, his second movement it has a period that we can identify. Let's listen to it and identify the period. As you can see, there's almost like a phrase that's being repeated um, with a few um, differences, right? Um, you have like the antecedent and then the consequent, as I said. And uh, as you can see, at the end of um, the antecedent, you have a cadence to five. Um, then you go back to the uh, beginning of another phrase, right? And then at the end of this last phrase, you have a cadence to one. Um, there's usually a proportion to periods. They are usually symmetric, like you have like a four uh, measure idea and then another four measure idea. This just makes it easier to digest. Right, so then we have a phrase group, which is actually very important. Because the thing about phrase groups and uh, periods is that a period has uh, an antecedent and a consequent relationship. Now, a phrase group um, is actually different because it might have um, a bigger number of, of phrases, right? So it might have like four or five phrases. Um, but the important thing about it is that there is no antecedent and consequent relationship. Um, the last phrase usually has um, like an important cadence just to finish the phrase group, but um, um, there's no like important cadence in from one phrasing to another. They're, they're just like one after the other, phrases, 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 until it stops, right? So um, we'll see an example of it so that it becomes clearer. Um, this example we already saw, it's Beethoven's um, Opus 59, number one, first movement once again. So let's listen to it and see how it works. Alright, 
so as you can see in this example, uh, we have four distinct phrases. Um, the first one starts and ends on C, the second one and the third one starts um, on D and ends on G, and the fourth one finally concludes um, the cycle, right? So there is no um, distinct like um, symmetry, like the first two ones, they um, are antecedents and the second two ones are a consequence. They are just one after the other um, and they just happen, you know? And I'm not saying that um, they don't have any like harmonic and cadential um, importance because they do, right? But um, what I'm saying is that they are not organized in a symmetric fashion and the cadential um, material that they contain, the harmonic material, um, is a lot freer um, in what you can do with it, right? So it is... Um, less common than periods, um, but it is important to know, especially if you're willing to analyze stuff, because it will appear from times to times and will be like, okay, this is not exactly a period, this is not exactly a sentence, what is it? It's sometimes a phrase group, right? So it's important to have that in mind. Right, so now the next and last um, structure we are going to analyze is the sentence. Well, the sentence is actually very important and this is because it contains a little bit of development on it. Um, it follows uh, a little bit of the logic on the um, previous examples, but uh, it presupposes a little bit of motivic and material development on it. So it's a great option if you're a composer, you can use it and it sometimes um, feels a little bit freer and the ideas feel a, li a little bit more complex without really being more complicated to achieve, right? So, so it's just a great structure to have in mind and to use um, from time to time. Okay, so this sentence is also divided into two parts. The first one is also divided into two parts, right? The, um, the first one, you have an antecedent and a consequence also. Um, it's just almost like a small period. You have like one tiny phrase and then another tiny phrase that are like juxtaposed and they usually have like this cadential um, character to it. Like you have the first one leading to a dominant and the second one leading to the tonic. Um, but then after that you have like the another big section which um, usually contains a little bit of motivic um, development or deconstruction, right? Um, and it's important to have that because then um, you conclude everything, like the sentence, a little bit more and it creates um, a lot of interest in the, the listener, right? So you have like this tiny structure in the beginning and then you have this motivic development. So the motivic development um, gets a little bit more complicated because then you're talking about development, which means that the composer might do whatever he wants. Um, so, I mean, analyzing it might get a little bit difficult because you can sometimes you can't be sure exactly where um, it ends you can speculate but what you will usually find is just one of the motifs from the um, previous part being extracted and being repeated um, in a way that the sentence resolves itself, you know, and we'll see an example of it, um, which is a great example. It's also um, Beethoven's Opus 2 number 1, this time the first movement. Um, we'll take a look at it and we'll understand how the sentence works and let's listen to it. So this is a great example because it is very clear to understand. Um, first of all, you have a phrase which contains like an upward arpeggio and then like a, a triplet idea, like an idea that contains a triplet, and then you have it repeated, right? Um, and then after that, you have that idea uh, with the triplet being repeated by itself without the initial arpeggio. Right, so as you can see, there are two main motifs, like the upward the arpeggio, then you have like that um, that continuation, like the second motif, then in the deconstruction, you have only the second motif being developed, and in the end, you just have a small closure, right? So if we look at the structure of it, we have um, two measures um, as the first phrase, then we have two measures as the second phrase, like the antecedent and the consequence. Then in the deconstruction, we have two measures of motivic development and another two measures of closure, right? So um, there's usually this relationship of like you have 
um, something of two measures or like four measures and then it divides into two measures and then one measure um, in this case this doesn't happen like um, sometimes if you have like a phrase that's like four measures long then you extract half of it and then you extract half of it once again right so you have like this um, deconstruction and it works really well in music because um, people understand it um, right away when they, they listen to it but um, you also demonstrate a little bit of um, capability as a composer because you are already developing ideas um, like right away in your um, musical composition so it's just a great option to have in mind right so these are the most important um, units and elements in musical form and composition um, now that you know that um, I'm working on another video about larger structures in musical form so if you want to um, learn about all of this um, and continue learning about musical form don't forget to subscribe I will probably upload it next weekend I'm posting every Saturday now so if you want to watch more of this um, don't forget to subscribe if you learned anything don't forget to leave a like and a comment down below saying that it helped you in it in any way and i'm really interested in hearing what you have to say about the subject all right so don't forget to do all the stuff thank you for watching i'll see you next time